Columbus, Ohio, until the latter half of the 20th century, where you lived and where you shopped depended on the color of your skin. Saturday was the bowling alley on Mount Vernon Avenue. Saturday was a novelty food bar, going to Mr. Beatty's restaurant for things you could not get anywhere else. Several African-American neighborhoods emerged. Flytown, the Badlands, American Edition. In order to get anything, if you were a minority in the early days, in the 60s and the 50s, and even the 70s, you came to the east side of Columbus. The largest and most vibrant African-American neighborhood developed on the city's east side, marked by Mount Vernon Avenue on the north and Long Street on the south. The kids in my neighborhood, a lot of times we get out on Mount Vernon Avenue and find us a good spot and sit down and just watch the parade because there was a giant parade going on all the time. Oh my gosh, it was pretty much just the, the perfect atmosphere in which to grow up in. Um, because everything was within walking distance from your hospitals or grocery stores, uh, doctor's offices, schools. In its heyday at the middle of the century, tens of thousands of people lived here. Its theaters and clubs drew the nation's top entertainers. Its schools produced champion athletes and gifted scholars. We had everything that you needed right there on the east side of Columbus. It was um, a lot of fun growing up there. There was whites, blacks, Jews, Italians, all sorts of people out there. Integrated but predominantly black, this enclave fostered the growth of a strong middle class served by locally owned businesses. The Ward Transfer and Storage Company would become the oldest continually running black owned business in the nation. Amos Lynch would publish a successful and influential newspaper here. It made more sense to buy from your neighbors. It made more sense to deal with people who you knew. It made more sense because you got better deals, you got better service, and you didn't get turned down because of the color of your skin. You know, it was still very much a segregated city when I was growing up. Not legally, but just physically, just almost spiritually. It was a segregated city, which is why I think that the movers and shakers invested so much into Mount Vernon, into the psychic dreams of Mount Vernon Avenue. People who lived here felt a deep sense of ownership for the neighborhood. They had built it themselves. A lot of the African-American owned uh, businesses were in buildings that had been built by African-Americans, constructed by African-American firms. I think one of the marks that this was truly an African-American community is the high regard that they gave uh, to the women in their lives. And so when you're traveling down Long Street and you see names above, you know, Teresa comes to mind, you're really talking about are the women's names who are the mothers and wives of the, um, the builders, the owners, and the entrepreneurs of the black community. You wouldn't see very many African-American physicians in Columbus downtown, but you would see them on Mount Vernon Avenue. In this office, a black man who had a medical license on his wall was treating my grandmother. That was sort of a powerful thing for a kid. One of Columbus's first African-American doctors helped build this neighborhood. The building you're sitting in is the uh, first African-American, first black hospital built uh, in Columbus, Ohio. It was built by Drs. Method and Dr. Tribbett in the early 20s. Dr. Tribbett was a dentist here in this community. Dr. Method was a surgeon. They are one of the first um, early graduating classes of Ohio Medical, which was Ohio State University's uh, medical college then at the time. And Drs. Tribbett and Method built this building because they found that um, they weren't necessarily going to get hired on um, in other practices and things, and that wasn't really their interest. Their interest was to provide high quality health care and resources to their community. They called Dr. Method the Dean of Negro Physicians. By 1930, this community had eclipsed other African American neighborhoods in Columbus. It was a remarkable transformation from what had been there before. 
Buffalo Bill came to Columbus on many occasions, and when he did, he set up all of the Indians and all of the cavalry and Cossacks and everything else that would ride with him uh, at St. Clair and Taylor. Then the stockyards were at the end of Taylor Avenue. They were part of the railroad, and therefore they were housing animals that were perhaps going on to other places in the United States. This was sort of a midway place. The railroads were starting to uh, really hire Irish. There were Irish who lived in the neighborhoods. There were Welsh who lived in the neighborhood. Uh, Italians, of course, and then African Americans. A lot of black families would get their opportunity to put food on their tables because of the, because of the railroads. St. Clair is an example of how this was a railroad community that was really being um, dominated by the Irish and African Americans and other groups that were coming in to work on the railroad. So it was clearly a segregated hospital early on, and then it will change to be a hotel at a later time. The neighborhood would become predominantly African American, but it was never exclusively so. Many of the city's movers and shakers built fine homes on streets such as Miami Avenue. And really they were the people that helped shape Columbus, not only from a business perspective, but also from a social perspective. And what happened, as is so often the case in Columbus, is folks kept on moving east, right? They moved to Franklin Park, then they moved to Bexley, and then further out. And as that happened, the successful African-American business people and the successful professionals ended up buying these houses. Originally, the house was built in 1890 by a man by the name of Donovan, uh, who owned a stove factory here in Columbus. And then afterwards, John D. White ended up purchasing the home from him. John D. White was a very famous uh, African-American doctor. He moved here from Pennsylvania. He was an obstetrician. Uh, he, he was very involved in delivering a lot of the babies in the area. And he lived here for 60 years. Mm -hmm. 